Sassman did respond quite quickly. We, um, by the time that um, we went, well, the time that the president announced lockdown, we had a significant portion of our staff working um, from home. And when we went into level five lockdown, we only had about 20 people or less entering the office every day. And even as we moved into level four, we uh, have retained very low numbers of people um, are on uh, are working uh, from the office. And uh, that being said, we've been able to ensure that all of our services and our products have been available to clients. To the best of my knowledge, we haven't missed any transactions or new loans or collections as a result of operational issues or challenges that one might expect in the face of such a, a, a huge um, move towards remote working. Um, what we as a banking group in this kind of environment uh, tend to do is to be more conservative. We tend to um, preserve capital and liquidity to ensure that um, we can weather the shocks. And um, throughout this period, um, as a group, our deposit book has been resilient. If anything, it's actually slightly up from where it was um, when we released our results um, in March for the half year to December. We close on uh, 6 billion Rand of deposits at a bank, um, at a bank level, Sassman bank level, which is quite nicely up. And um, one of the things which happens in, in this environment is that we um, probably are writing less loans. So our loan book starts to come off slightly, which has, a profit challenge in the medium to long term. Um, but what that also does, though, however, is it improves our capital and liquidity position. As our book, especially this rental finance book, amortizes, what happens is, is that we take cash and the book is amortizing. Um, and uh, that then reduces our risk weighted assets, which in turn improves our capital adequacy ratio and that improves our liquidity position. Obviously, many, many of our clients, like the whole economy, are facing severe stress. And therefore, we have been uh, granting payment holidays in terms of the Reserve Bank's uh, uh, restructured loan relief in terms of Corona, which they've provided. We have given a number of our clients payment holidays. Typically, that's been in the format of a three-month payment holiday. <clears throat> and... Uh, that um, means that we just extend the life of these leases. And uh, we only provide those where, we, where the client was in good standing prior to Corona and where we, on some basis, believe that the client will return to good standing um, post-Corona. So therefore, we do expect that, that that does mean, however, just the way the, the accountants and the Saab are treating this, is that if you restructure a loan in terms of Corona under this payment holiday scheme, you, you can keep those loans in what they call your stage one IFRS nine bucket, which um, doesn't result in a meaningful impact, increase in impairments. But where clients weren't in good standing before, or we are concerned about the long-term sustainability of those businesses, or, um, the client didn't specifically request a payment holiday, but just went into arrears. There we do start raising provisions as they move through the various stages, um, as, as essentially as the arrears increase. Um, and uh, therefore, we are starting to see um, in the month of, already in the month of March and the month of April, we are starting to see a, a slight uptick in impairments. And um, I think that that is likely to continue in the coming months. And in some ways, <clears throat> as the payment holiday period comes to an end, some of that risk will be deferred um, by some time. All of that being said, we remain well within our uh, triggers. And Desigan, I'm sure, will take you through the detail in terms of the SAS vehicle. What's also important to note is that a lot of our book doesn't uh, reprice with Prime. Um, so unless Prime goes up, about a third of our book. And that gives us a, uh, 
a slight margin benefit um, as the interest rates have come down. Also, what we did is when the um, when the Reserve Bank cut interest rates, we didn't on new deals give that full benefit to our clients. We uh, essentially did drop rates to clients, but um, not to the full extent, in part to ensure that we start building some additional buffers to deal with increased credit risk. And again, I'm sure Desigan can take you through some of that detail to a greater extent. Um, so high level, the capital and liquidity positions, you know, given the potential outlook of this virus and lockdown um, is our top priority. And on both of those fronts, we are, as I, as I mentioned, in a slightly stronger position than when we were um, at the time of the interim reporting. Um, I think profits will come under some pressure as we see a drop off in turnover and an increase in impairments and as the economy continues to contract. So that is expected. Um, and, uh, you know, but, but all of our services are up and running. Fortunately, no one within the SASFIN environment uh, has uh, contracted Corona to the best of my knowledge. And um, we've complied with all the health and safety regulations. Um, and that's been made easier by the fact that we've been able to fast track a lot of the remote working. One of the other points which I'm sure is of interest uh, to our investors in the SASP vehicle is the long-term outlook of rental finance. So what we've been doing over the last number of years is expanding our industry focus. This business for a long time was heavily dominated by office automation. There obviously is a concern that the need for office automation will reduce as the fourth industrial revolution or work from home um, kind of is fast tracked. But what we've been doing in the last few years is expanding our industry focus. So we now are renting uh, medical equipment and we're renting green energy based equipment, software in certain instances. And um, while we saw a huge drop in turnover, in other words, by, by turnover, I mean, um, new deals paid out in the month of April um, with the uh, level five lockdown. We are starting to see some of those deals come through. We are obviously applying a very cautious credit mentality given the, the, the huge shocks in the economy. Um, but some of the deals that are coming through are coming from these uh, newer industries where we built some capabilities and from large uh, businesses where we are comfortable with the credit risk. So once again, just to thank you, many of you have been investors in our vehicle for many years. As you know, this vehicle has been going since uh, 1991 and it has uh, stood the test of time. And even when there was the securitization crisis, if you want to call it that, or the global financial crisis in 2008, the securitization vehicle stood strong in part because of uh, you, our investors, and in part because of the, the huge granularity within the book. There's a wide spread of uh, clients um, because of the inherent yield that we have in the book and because of our cautious credits approach. So I think that's really my introductory remarks. Um, and just to thank everyone, I'm happy to take any questions. I see there is one question uh, from someone in the audience uh, regarding whether we can hear them because they can't mute their screen. Only the panelists are able to engage um, in, the, in the conversation, to the best of my knowledge. Um, but if anyone on the, uh, amongst the attendees wishes to engage us, the best way to do that is via the chat function. If for whatever reason that isn't uh, adequate for the queries that you might want to raise with us, we're happy to schedule calls. Um, we're happy to schedule calls with you. Oh no, so I've just been advised, sorry, by our marketing team that actually we can unmute the, um, the attendees um, if t attendees want to speak. So just let us know that. Please advise us on the chat if you would like to uh, ask us anything and we'll try and cross over to you um, at that moment. In the meanwhile, if you've got any questions, um, please put them on the chat. And with that, I'll hand over to Desigan, I believe. Thanks, Michael. Um, and welcome to our SASP investors. 
thank you for giving us the um, opportunity to uh, present to you and engage as we promised um, earlier on in the year. Um, I just want to get straight into the um, SAS performance for uh, the months of March and April. Um, um, we'll start with uh, series one. Um, the delinquencies and defaults, as you can see, we've had uh, from March to April, there has been a, a, a increase in delinquencies, but um, it's, it's also showing a slight decrease in the uh, defaults. The net default trigger, which is a blue line on the screen, is uh, representative of the um, defaults less recoveries. The month of April, we've had uh, quite a good recoveries month. So although the delinquencies increase slightly, um, the defaults have uh, decreased. Uh, and this is a trend we saw in all three of our series. Um, that's series two, uh, which also shows a decrease in the default and default trigger. And um, um, similar trend in the delinquencies, we did see a rise in delinquencies from um, March to April and series three as well. So um, in terms of uh, a lot of the engagements I've been having uh, on a bilateral basis with the investors was the concerns around um, the performance and the triggers and whether there's you know, going to be any requests from investors to, um, to uh, relax any of the triggers. As you can see, our, our performance triggers on the delinquencies and defaults um, are, are very much in line with what we've seen thus far. Um, as Michael mentioned, we are um, you know, we're quite early in the stages of, of the lockdown. Um, the impacts of this is going to be felt at later, you know, at a later stage. So um, at, at this at this point in time, we don't see any reason for you know there not being enough uh, um, headroom in our in our triggers to uh, you know cushion or withstand what's coming down the line. Um, so moving on from the delinquencies and defaults, the next. Sorry about that. The next thing I want to speak about is a yield analysis. Um, just coming back to what Michael said on the high prime deals, um, throughout the group, over um, one third of our book is high prime, um, in that they only reset the pricing when prime goes up, but there's no impact on the, on the, on the yield if prime comes down. So from the beginning of the year with the 225 basis points decrease, um, we've got the benefit of that yield uh, in the vehicle. And uh, the average yield uh, year to date in each three series um, ranges from 18.24 in series one, 15.47 uh, in series two, and 16.1% in series three. And um, the, um, the What's listed in the brackets um, is the benchmarks, which we measure these again. So that's the trigger level, um, prime plus five in series one, prime plus three and a half in series two, and prime plus four in series uh, three. Um, I think from this, uh, what we're demonstrating is that um, there is sufficient uh, headroom here as well. And, and I mean, the yield and the spread on the, on the structure is, is, is very high in a, normal, um, in a normal circumstance, but you know, with the high prime deals and a, and a decreasing prime um, rate, we see quite a, quite a healthy uh, position on the yield in all three series. Um, then I just want to speak a little bit about the credit announcement. Um, uh, I think we normally, on our road shows, we, uh, we share this information and, and I think um, just, just to demonstrate the, um, the announcement levels for each uh, class of note within the series um, and uh, the levels at which we are um, basically uh, you know, enhancing this, this structure. 
Um, series one, for example, has quite a quite a significant um, first and second loss uh, portion. Um, I, I see there is a mistake on the slide, but um, the 12.54 and the 4.46 um, basically comes out to about 17% of enhancement before any of the, the rated notes. Um, and that, that is our, our, our you know, Rolls Royce of, of the three. Um, and the second loss loan we use to purchase uh, subordinated loans to over collateralize the portfolio. Um, series two um, is a smaller series. The enhancement levels are, um, are lower, um, but I think um, for, for the investors that are invested in series two, you would remember that these were um, not AAA rated notes um, and they were only upgraded um, recently. And then lastly, our series three, which, is, which was the ex um, um, FinTech uh, book, uh, which is now incorporated as series three. And we've just maintained the levels of announcement at that, of that book. Um, but across all three of our uh, classes of rated notes, you can see that there's significant levels of announcement and those maintained, nothing, nothing has changed in the structure. Um, and um, just some of the performance tests we run on a monthly basis. I spoke about the net defaults and the, and the yield um, and the over collateralization. But in terms of uh, reserve, res cash reserving, we have two reserve funds. One um, where we keep a cash reserve, which is equal to the uh, first loss uh, amount in each series. So that's held in cash. And then the second cash reserve is an arrears reserve fund. So all deals that are um, in NPL status or uh, that fall into arrears, we reserve cash for the full um, NPV of those deals. So um, those are trigger levels that we, or performance levels that we monitor monthly, and those cash balances together with the other um, triggers are, are maintained and reported on um, every month. At the end of March, um, all of these performance uh, tests were well within the benchmarks. Um, the next thing I want to speak about uh, per series is just on the portfolio concentration limit. And this is just to highlight that um, nothing has changed in terms of the granularity uh, of the portfolio. We're still well within the benchmarks, which we, you know, which we monitor on a, on a portfolio basis um, from a single obligor uh, right down to the top 300 uh, leases in series one. And um, if you look at, the number of performing leases, um, 13,900 performing leases in series one, which uh, it again demonstrates the, um, the granularity of, of the book. Um, if we go to series two, um, here because of capital equipment uh, leases and not only office equipment, we have a higher single lessee uh, um, exposure limit and that's at seven and a half percent being the benchmark, but the highest um, in terms of the actual is the highest NPV is just 4.89% of the, of the notes in issue uh, of the total portfolio. And then uh, if we look at the top 10, 25 and 50 leases, there's still quite um, a lot of headroom between all of them. Uh, and then the number of performing leases, because series three is, is uh, sorry, series two is a, is a smaller um, amount and um, larger value, you'd see that the loan, the number of loans is, is less in series one. However, if you look at it um, compared to the benchmark, there is still significant uh, amount of uh, deals included, included in the structure, which also adds to the granularity because um, whilst it is made up of capital equipment leases, there's also, um, uh, we also include some uh, uh, office equipment in, in the portfolio as well. Then lastly, um, for series three, um, 
similar portfolio uh, concentration. Um, it's a it's a larger series, uh, similar to series one. And uh, if you look at the top uh, 10, 20, 30, there's significant headroom within those. The number of leases in, in series three as well is um, almost double what the uh, benchmark uh, is it's measured against. Um, and then uh, what I just wanted to show the investors as well is um, I think everything I've, I've been saying in, in, in one slide, um, as at the end of March, uh, these are the, the values of each portfolio, the number of total leases, um, and then average outstanding balance. Um, if you look at series one, uh, average outstanding balance of just under 55,000, um, again, with, with 25,000 leases in total, um, it demonstrates again the, the granularity um, well across all three uh, series. Um, and if we look at the um, term, the remaining term and the seasoning, um, it's very consistent with what investors would be used to in the, um, in the series. Um, and, and the other, the last thing I want to uh, touch on is the high prime. Um, and, and the effects of the high prime impacts our yield. So series one and series two um, is in, in excess of 60% of, of the portfolio's high prime deals and series three is 30%. Um, so I think that covers mostly what I want to update investors on, on March and April performance. Um, there's just a few other things I would like to, to cover before we take any questions. And I think I can hand over to Leon after this slide just to, to field any questions if anyone wants to ask questions directly. Um, the first thing is um, originations. Michael touched on it. Uh, you know, this is um, what I've captured in this slide is some of the questions I've been getting from investors that I've been dealing with on a bilateral basis. And um, the concern was, uh, you know, with the, with the lockdown, with um, businesses, uh, you know, going through some tough economic times, what and how are we as, as SAS and SAS um, dealing with the, uh, with the uh, you know, with the decreased originations and would there be any impact on um, the, the number of deals and the amount of deals um, that we buy into the structure um, if, there's, if there's a significant uh, decrease in originations at the bank level. Um, so there's two, there's two things I just want to say, say on that. Um, obviously, as we started off, the, we do expect things to get worse. From, from an originations perspective. But what we have done in, uh, in Feb already is we've looked at the, um, the amount of deals that we currently have on our balance sheet um, that would be, a, would be available for uh, top-ups on a monthly basis across all three of our series. At that time, we had a runway of one year. So basically, if, if in March we stopped writing business completely, we would have had at least a year's worth of deals on our balance sheet to top up the structure um, before, um, before it goes into any sort of uh, position without being able to add a new deal. That, that number has changed because obviously in March and April, We've got all, you know, these um, requests for payment moratoriums and, and, and restructuring of, of loans and all of that, which I'm going to get to next. But um, we, we've, we've had significant um, headroom to, you know, to withstand um, a lengthy period of no origination. Um, and just to give you, I think, the second part of, of, of that question or the way uh, we can respond to that is um, I, I think the month of April uh, we have seen decreased uh, originations however 
it was not it was not no i mean um i think uh, we we expect a certain amount but uh, we were about i think about 60% um of of what we expected we achieved so it was about 40% down on at at a bank level for for new for new deal um that was in the month of april um we'd be able to give some feedback you know probably in june as to what um what the uh, what the originations were in may but uh, for the month of april we we still had a relatively um decent um origination um considering that it was a complete lockdown um the next thing i wanted to cover was payment moratoriums um and michael touched on this uh, specifically around businesses that um felt that they would not be able to meet the obli- the payment obligations um and and the way we treated those was um if if the business or, or the only time sasman would be able to grant or even consider a payment moratorium was if uh the the client the client or the customer was already in a good standing so if if a client was already was in an npl status um we would not consider a grant payment moratoriums we um we uh, we we had some discussions with uh, both our legal counsel and the rating agents as to how to treat these if at all we could treat these um as payment moratoriums in sas unfortunately the uh, response from both was that the documents and the agreements with the way they currently worded do not allow for payment moratoriums and um the rating agents uh, were quite um uh, quite strict on on how we would classify these so if if the if we had to do a payment moratorium in sas um and the client uh gets a 3 month payment holiday that deal would forever be in uh in an npl status because the term of that transaction is not uh changed so what we've decided um with uh ens and the um rating agents was all payment moratorium for for deals that were securitized if uh the client was not in uh, not in in, in any npl status that deal would be swapped or or um replaced with a deal of of a similar npv tenor and uh yield from our balance sheet um and and it would be re- removed from the vehicle so um no payment moratoriums or restructuring occurs in sas now um there were there was a lot of questions around is this um you know kind of managing the performance but um we don't view it as that we've checked with uh, the legal counsel and with um the rating agents basically what we're doing is we're replacing a, a performing deal at the time with another performing deal so it is a replacement which the rules allow um because i think the, with the payment moratorium and the way it's it's currently being granted at the assessment level is that the um the client will be given a holiday of 3 months and in month 4 they will start paying um and the, the term of their loan is restructured if we had to keep that in sas the that client even when they start paying in month 4 will be in an npl status right up until um uh, the the termination of that of that loan so um for now there's no uh payment moratorium is being granted in sas um all of that uh is being done at a bank level and if there are securitized deals that require these moratoriums we are just replacing it with other performing deals um 
so that's the, the you know we remain within the rules of the of the vehicle. Um, the next thing I just wanted to cover was the um, the Saab directives. There's basically three uh, related, um, kind of related to to uh, securitization and and the investors. I think a lot of a lot of focus at uh, from securitization investors is also on the originator being Sassan. Um, the Saab have granted uh, directives for a, a lower liquidity coverage ratio and um, a lower uh, capital adequacy ratio. Um, we at Sassan, we believe that uh, at this stage, certainly with our improve, uh, improving um, liquidity and capital uh, position, we wouldn't be uh, utilizing the um, um, the, uh, the the graces being offered by the Reserve Bank. Um, we have quite a healthy liquidity coverage ratio, and um, as I said, an improving capital adequacy. I think it was touched on by Michael as well um, with respect to you know with with the muted business growth we expect our capital and liquidity to improve. And then the third directive um, specifically related is the directive on restructured loans, uh, the payment moratorium. So I think what the Reserve Bank wanted um, was to um, you know, group all of the uh, uh, loans that, uh, that so, so we had to have a record of all the loans that have and clients that have been granted this moratorium, because in terms of the um, uh, the classification of um, NPLs, they would have a separate and from an audit perspective, they would uh, they would be looked or viewed at as a separate class of classification of uh, NPLs. So those are the three that that uh, I just want to touch on. Um, and then I just want to give an update on the servicing administration and reporting. Um, here again, uh, you know, to tie in with what Michael said, um, ever since we've uh, commenced working remotely, there's been no, um, you know, everything has been business as usual. All our systems for um, whether it's servicing administration, reporting, are mostly cloud-based, so you know we have the capabilities of of working remotely. Um, there has been uh, we've done the the monthly reporting, uh, the servicing as I commenced with the the uh, collections and uh, recoveries have actually improved. Um, from an administration perspective, uh, we've got the um, the backup servicer of uh, the three series as being two separate companies so all of that is in place but at this stage there was no need to even call on them then I just like to end off by uh, reminding some of our investors uh, we do have a SAS uh, series one refinance in August of uh, notes to the value of 253 million um, and like we uh, because it's one of our smaller refinances, we would offer uh, the existing holders the opportunity to extend. And if that's not the case, we would, uh, if, if they don't wish to, we would then offer to the broader investor base. So um, yeah, I think that's it from me. I'm not sure um, if Leon's got any questions. There's been quite a few questions that have been raised on the chat here. Um, so maybe, unless Leon, you want to comment before we start touching on these questions. Uh, thank you, Michael. No, um, I think this can cover well. I've got a couple of questions that came through on my uh, phone. So maybe you can start with the ones you can see, and then I'll post the questions I received. Okay, so I'll just read out the question uh, that, that I can't answer, um, and then the ones that you know, I can answer, I'll answer. So from Nicholas Naiduk, uh, thanks Nick for your question. Good day, given the remarks that a large portion of the book doesn't read Prime, down with Prime, and that additional buffer, 
via excess spread will be earned in the future. Is the, attempt, is the attempt intention to allow this excess spread to remain in the structures to build up sufficient liquidity buffers, even if trigger levels have not been breached as yet? Okay, Michael, I'll, I'll answer that one. I think, um, look, the, the, the trigger levels and, and the buffers, um, I, I, I covered a little bit of it in the in credit announcement slide. We have you know, quite a lot of buffers uh, existing. At this stage, uh, Nicholas, we don't expect to see um, you know, the triggers even breaching those buffers. So in terms of the liquidity and the spread, uh, we, we obviously would keep uh, buffers in there, but I mean, um, there's our, our, our trigger levels on the, on the structure are quite finite. And these additional liquidity buffers would not help, uh, you know, any of our performance triggers. So whilst it's, you know, it, it's, it's great for the transaction, um, it's not our intention to use that to, to buffer or, or provide any other additional buffers for triggers. Okay, thanks, Tess. Then, Chris Stewart, to what would you ascribe the improvement in recoveries? And there was a related uh, question from Kubashan on this as well. Um, given the current very difficult environment, are there any specific assets which are showing divergent, better or worse recovery rate? Maybe I'll just comment to say that last year in April, we went live with uh, a new system in our rental finance business called LeaseWage. And then we also implemented, uh, we went to our first year in total um, of the business. Yes, maybe do you want to just mute your phone while I'm sorry. Back? sorry. Um, so we went through, uh, uh, we, we implemented this new system and we went through our first year's lease wave and that did result in some challenges um, in our collections business and that is partly what explained that large increase in impairments, uh, in arrears let me rather say, going uh, towards the end of last year. Um, during uh, that time we did a lot of work to address those issues. Um, it takes some time for those uh, um, deals to cure if they've gone into arrears. Um, and that is what ex um, explains the recovery post December towards, say, March um, to a large degree. Um, and then we now starting to see a bit of a pickup now. Um, and obviously, if we take, if, if they are, as Desigan mentioned, clients that we, we are going to award payment holidays to, those are then coming out of the vehicle. Um, so therefore, in those instances, the vehicle is kind of protected. Um, so hopefully that will, uh, you know, uh, we'll manage on that basis um, and then putting other, uh, the better quality deals into, uh, into the vehicle um, in those instances. Um, then Kubishan had a couple of follow-up questions. How do we see uh, the rears evolving as lockdown remains fairly restrictive? I think it will be a challenge. There's no doubts about it. Um, and uh, even though we've got this big spread of clients um, and we've got uh, kind of healthy buffers, I think that we should expect to see an uptick, but we feel that we will be operating within the buffers of the vehicle, as Jessica mentioned. With regards to assessment experience and clients going into liquidation or business rescue, so where we've had good security um, and there's been no uh, fraud, we've generally speaking, this is more a general comment than rather a comment vis-a-vis -vis clients inside the vehicle itself. So it's more a general SASFIN wide comment. Um, we've done pretty well in collecting out on our exposure because of the security positions we take. Sometimes what happens is that uh, we are in a business rescue situation, there is fraud. 
So either stock is overstated or debtors are overstated, um, other assets might be overstated, and that, and, and then some mysteriously, these different uh, asset types which we place some reliance on disappear. And in those instances, which are, which are the exception, um, we do uh, tend to take a bit of pain. Um, right now, we are seeing uh, a general increase in business rescue across the board. But um, specifically in the rental finance business, where the SaaS vehicle has its exposure, there, there's a very big spread. Uh, uh, unlike, uh, say, some of the uh, larger clients where we've got trade finance facilities or debt to finance facilities to on the bank's balance sheets. And those ones, while there isn't as big a spread, there we have a very, very, uh, we engage with those clients on a, almost a weekly basis, I would say. Um, especially the ones which we classify as high care. Um, and then, to Stephen, to your question, I can't, um, I can't, there's no real answer. Okay, the question, sorry, because I'm aware I'm not even can read the question. What proportion of the total book and SAS pool has seen payment holidays, respectively? So I think Desi can address that. Um, what has the collection experience been the total book and the SAS pool, respectively? So that's also been dealt with. I'll just say that from a SAS and wide perspective, in our asset finance business, of which about, which more than half sits on the bank's balance sheet itself, I would say that at the end of April, so, you know, it's a dynamic situation, this, I can't give you figures up uh, over the last two weeks, but by the 30th of April, I would say less than 7.5% um, in value, not in number of clients. Um, so I think that also deals with uh, Chris's question. Um, and some of those are large blue chip names that you'll be familiar with where we are comfortable with the, 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 the client. I'll, I'll mention one, even though we don't normally talk to client names, but take Bell Equipment, for example. And they, they mentioned it in a sense announcement of theirs that they've managed to agree to payment holidays from their financiers. So I'm not telling you anything which is... Uh, um, a big secret, but that is one of those clients who we've got an, a, a nice ex exposure to, um, where we're very comfortable with their long-term outlook, even though they needed some of that support in the short term. Um, then Tando has asked a question, um, and Tando, I see that you might want to raise your question or your comment um, to the group, which I'm happy to uh, uh, open to but the question is on the capital holidays what is the uptake for the option and will you be able to continuously swap such loans from the vehicle if the situation worsens so i think i've given you a sense of the uptake Desigan, i don't know if you can um give some sense as to how we would engage uh should the situation worsen and our ability i think we're sitting with a meaningful portion of deals in the bank's balance sheet which are up to date. And then obviously we continue to write new deals. Desigan did mention that in April, we contracted our new deals quite a bit. May actually hasn't started off too bad as we've moved into uh, level four. And um, uh, so I think in May, there will be, uh, what, you know, there, there is demand. We just being very conservative in the way in which we award credit at this time, for all the obvious reasons. But Jessica, I don't know if you can elaborate any further on any of the questions or comments that I've given in response. I'm including that last one. But remember, you're on mute. Yeah. Um, so, Michael, I think you, you've covered everything uh, quite well. Just on the last question from Chando, um, the, the one thing I do want to say is that in, in our scenario planning, we... Um, we uh, made the assumption that there will be no new business and right now we are we are writing business although it's been down in april we expect it to be down in may so you know it is it is a balance between um uh, you know some clients that are uh, that are requesting payment moratoriums there is some additional new deals so um we we do see a, a little bit of of uh, runway uh, where SAS will be uh, shielded but um, you know obviously 
if if we have to start doing these in um, in within SAS, we're going to take a very uh, punitive approach in terms of how we classify them. They will be um, as um, or reported as NPLs from the time um, if and when a payment moratorium is granted. There is a question here on our current approval rates from Kubishan and on new business, what percentage of that new business is with existing clients. If you give me a couple of minutes, I'll be able to give you uh, something a bit more accurate in a sense. I think it is it has dropped quite a bit. Um, and I've got the report, I just need to source it. Testing, I don't know if you know it offhand. No, sorry, Michael, I don't. Okay, I'll, I'll look for that. In the meanwhile, I'm not sure if there are any other questions or, uh, from, the, from the audience. Uh, Michael, I've got a question uh, coming from Jackie Eberly from Aluwani Capital. She just wanted to know how the uh, lockdown of the courts uh, would influence recoveries going forward. Sorry, uh, Leon, I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Um, so she said, do we expect that the lockdown in the courts would impact uh, our re recoveries going forward? No, it, it is a good point. It, it could impact our recoveries. We are concerned about it. They, they are starting to engage. Um, what we've done in the meanwhile, is we've converted our legal team. You've got quite a few people sitting on our legal team, and a legal team is typically once the deal um, has uh, gone past a certain stage in arrears. So what we've now done is we've converted our legal team to a pre-legal team. So they are getting uh, very actively involved in collections. So we've expanded our collections outfit um, by giving. Um, uh, the legal resources to that team and they're very capable in doing that to try and avoid these things going a bit further down the line. Um, so I think it, it might impact us, but, um, in, but I think that we are, we are dealing with some legal matters at the same time, often the ones that are dealt by arbitration. We've done a couple of those via Microsoft Teams and Zoom and whatever else. Um, so, uh, yeah, I can't give a, I can't quantify it in any way. Okay, um, I, I see uh, Tando has asked another question, um, which is um, for the loans that are already in arrears, I assume provisioning has increased for these. Um, so Tando, I, I will respond to your question from, from a SAS point of view because I, I believe that's from that perspective is what you're asking. Um, so in terms of, the, in terms of the, the rules of the structure, we, we start provisioning um, as soon as the, the deals go into 60 days arrear. So we, we have um, 30 days um, a missed payment, which would be um, 60 days arrears. Uh, is when we start fully providing in terms of cash within the structure. And that's, that is reserved in the arrears reserve, the cash reserves. So that, that doesn't change. Um, we, we fully provide for it from the time it's uh, 60 days since the last payment. Yeah, I think what is important to note, uh, just to Tando's comment, is that in terms of IFRS 9, You've got to uh, also include forward-looking data. And as the forward-looking data for the country has obviously changed in the world, uh, given the lockdown and the rating, et cetera, that um, could in and of itself result in slightly higher provisioning as well. Um, to Kubishan's question about the current approval rates of new business, um, I can't tell you what portion of that is with existing clients, but I can tell you that Typically, by value, we range at about 50% approval rates in uh, the last month or so. And this, is my, this might be a little bit outdated, 
So this might be towards uh, the beginning of April, end of March, uh, dropped to 33%. So that's quite a big drop in approval rates. Um, and my sense is that in April that continued. Um, and in May, uh, it probably has also continued at a similar level. Sometimes by looking at, at value, might be skewed by one or two slightly bigger deals. Um, so if you look at it by volume, um, by number of clients, um, the approval rate didn't drop as, uh, as much um, by volume as it did by value. Um, it dropped maybe by about 15%, uh, whereas on, on value, it dropped by 30, 30-odd percent. Um, on behalf of all of us, to once again, thank you for your uh, support. Just if anyone would like to engage with us directly, please feel free to reach out to us on any front and uh, keep safe to you and your families and good luck in navigating these very challenging times. Thank you very much.